Today we will talk about inner products, talk about orthogonality, and finally show how Gram Schmidt might work in a more general setting than RN. So let's start with inner products proper. We already saw inner products in RN before, but now what we're going to do is generalize the notion of distance. It's not really restricted to Euclidean length. For example, we might be interested in travel time. How far is it between here and New York City? How long does it take? Or some directions might be more difficult than others. Suppose we're on a hike, we're walking in the valley, and on either side of us is a big climb. So if we deviate from our straight line toward the side, we're going to have a much harder time of it. And so we'd like to measure that as well. The notation I will use is the generic notation for inner products, that open bracket uv close bracket notation rather than u dot v. But whenever you see this notation, just think u dot v. So let's consider two examples. The first one is I'm in R3, I have two vectors u and v. However, in my inner product, I'm now going to emphasize u1, v1 has a much higher cost associated with it compared to direction two, compared to direction three. So the inner product of u and v is going to be this factor three times u1, v1, a factor two applied to u2, v2, and a factor one applied to u3, v3. The norm then, when I compute the Euclidean length, it gets generalized as well. It simply becomes these factors are associated with it since the norm of u is just the inner product of u with itself. The metric, the distance measure that we get is as before, it's the norm of v minus u, but now this norm has these factors. A second example, a little bit more general is to say, well, what I did just now is I emphasized the directions of my coordinate system of i, j, k. But what if I have different directions? Well, if I have different directions, this simply generalizes to the form u transpose times a matrix times v. And of course, since we want this inner product to have the required properties so that we can define a metric, that matrix C has to be restricted. We will see later that this restriction is called positive definite, that the matrix itself has to be positive definite. But for right now, just be aware that there is a restriction. So the norm that we get, the length of the inner product of u with itself is just u transpose cu, and the metric, again, is the norm, but now the norm is this more general inner product than before. If instead of Rn, I'm going to look at function spaces, no, what might I think is the distance between two functions? So what we'll do is we'll first of all think about functions as vectors. Namely, if I start with Rn and have a vector u in Rn, I can think of that vector as a function that maps some index, i equals 1, 2, 3, to the corresponding entry in the vector. So a function from the index to the corresponding entry. A function f just generalizes this idea. The index is typically called x, and so we are mapping an index x to some value f of x. Let's look at an example. Suppose I have my function f of x as x squared plus 1, where x is on some interval, let's say minus 1, 3, with the endpoints included. And we've already seen that that denotes a vector in the set of functions defined on that closed interval minus one to three. I'm now going to pull different values of x out of that function. So I'm going to look at just specifically the x's at x equals minus one, zero, one half, and two. So the sampled vector f of s at x equals minus one, for example, uh, minus one squared plus one is equal to two. At x equals zero, I get one. And so after I plug all these x values in, I actually have a vector in R4. Now, if I give you an example of what this looks like, I've got a little bit of code here that computes this function. Then here's what I see. In blue, I've drawn the function f of x is x squared plus 1. Then in green, 
the values of that function f of x at the specific x values that I pulled out. So you see the vector in R4, the four different values of that sampled function, plus the vector of all of the values of the functions with index x, where x goes from any value from minus 1 to plus 3 inclusive. So my vector f of x in the space of functions is this graph, and my sampled vector f of x at the x values that I chose is a vector, in this case, in R4. So examples of inner products for functions f of x. If I think about inner products for a sampled vector, it would just be the function at index minus 1 times the other function at index minus 1. So let's say two functions f and g. So f at minus 1 times g at minus 1 plus f at 0 times g at 0, etc. If I generalize this to continuous values x, instead of the summation of that product f of x times g of x, I'm going to have an integral. So here I've got the integral from minus 1 to 3 for all the values over which I'm considering those functions. And I chose to average out the interval, so the average value of f of x times g of x is this particular example. And we can verify that, yes, that is indeed an inner product. It satisfies all the requirements that we might want. Another example would be scaling, applying different costs for different values of x. So in this example here, I did away with that 1 over 4 term, but instead I'm applying a weight at each value x. So f of x and g of x at a x equals 0 gets a weight e to the third power. So if I now look at the definition of a norm I might get, let's take that first example. Then what we see is the length of that function, if you will, is the square root of the inner product of the function with itself. And so in the first case here, it's the square root of our inner product of the function with itself. So the integral from minus 1 to 3 of f squared of x dx. The metric that we define from that is just the same as before, but it's now defined in terms of this length. Now that we have an idea of the length of functions, of a norm of functions, we can define orthogonality as before. So vectors u are orthogonal to vectors v if and only if the inner product is zero. And as an example, let's stick with our two vectors, but give weights to different directions. So u1, u2, v1, v2, and the inner product is defined as 3 u1, v1, plus u2, v2. Then if I pick a vector u equals 1, 1, and I'm asking for this vector u to be orthogonal to a vector v, I'm going to have to require that the inner product is equal to 0. So I'm going to have to require, when I plug in, that 3 times v1 plus v2, since u1 is 1 and u2 is 2, 3 times v1 plus v2, that that add up to 0. This is the line all points of which are orthogonal to this vector u. If I show you that as a graph, this is what I get, that the vector u and the vector v are orthogonal in this inner product. So since one direction, since the x direction had a larger value associated with it, that factor 3 associated with it, that distorts my original picture, my orthogonal picture, to bias the orthogonal line toward my blue vector. So we still have a notion of orthogonality, but what it is is our definition of cost, that the cost from plus u and the cost from minus u to go to some point, that that cost be the same. Now that we have orthogonality, the definition of Gram-Schmidt goes through as before. As an example, Let's look at functions f1 of x equals 1, f2 is equal to x, f3 is equal to x squared. So just three powers of x. The inner product, just the integral of the product of the functions on the interval minus 1 to 1, a symmetric interval. And the norm is the square root of the inner product of f with itself as before, 
And what I'm going to do is I apply the Gram-Schmidt procedure. I'm going to have to integrate powers of x. So I'm going to need integrals from minus 1 to 1 of x of n. And I chose to pull out the factor of 1 half to make the formula simple. If I integrate that out, it depends. If n is even, I have a value of 1 over n plus 1. If n is odd, it integrates out to 0, since my function is an odd value and the area of an odd function is 0. So let's do Gram-Schmidt. And Gram-Schmidt works as before. Wherever you had a dot product before, we now have to put in that inner product. First step, w1 is equal to f1. And therefore, our first vector, w1 of x, is f1 of x is equal to 1. If I normalize it, if I integrate f of x equal to 1 and divide through by the length, I just get square root of 2 over 2. The second step, function w2. Well, w2 is f2 minus f2 dot w1 over w1 dot w1 in the w1 direction. Just replace the dots with inner products and plug in the values. f2 of x was x minus the interproduct of x with the w that we found before divided by w dot w, the inner product of 1 with 1, times the function w1 times the function f of x equals 1. And when I integrate all of that out, I just get x. And when I look at the size of x, well, that puts a scale factor on that x is square root of 3 over 2. In step 3, I'm going to write down my formula as before. w3 is f3 minus f3 dot w1 over w1 dot w1 times w1 minus f3 dot w2 over w2 dot w2 in the times w2. And when we plug in now, we have for the w, since the w2 was just x and w1 was just 1, we get x squared minus the inner product of x squared and the function 1 divided by the inner product of the function 1 with itself times the function f of x equals 1 minus now the same thing with the function f of x equals x. And when we integrate everything out and add it up together, we get x squared minus 1 third. Compute the length of x squared minus 1 third, so that the norm of w3, and divide through, and now we get x squared minus 1 third with a scale factor to make sure that the length of that function q3 of x is indeed equal to 1 when we use that inner product function. So everything goes through as before. It's just that our notation is a little bit different and the definition of the inner product is whatever it happens to be. That's the extent of what I want to show you about inner product spaces. The main message here is that everything works as before. It's just that we now have different computations to do when we compute the length of a vector and different computations to do when we compute the inner product of two vectors.